a Mozillian and Rustation by Heart, Henry Sivonen got a great start, potting Firefox char, handling two rusts so far, it's been quietly doing its part. Henry Sivonen. Uh, hi, I'm, I'm Henry Sivonen. I, I work for Mozilla on the Gecko engine, and today I'm gonna talk about a Rust crate that also quacks like a modern C++ library. Uh, so since we're at RustFest, we probably want to write Rust code, but many times there's existing C++ code that we need that Rust code to integrate with. Rust's FFI provides C APIs, and uh, C++ community kind of frowns upon plain C, so we're, we'll probably be better uh, accepted if we can provide more C++-like APIs. So today I'm gonna show you one weird trick for making Rust objects look like C++ objects, and then I'm gonna show you uh, rustic modern C++ types. The examples we're gonna look at today come from a crate called Encoding RS, which is a character encoding conversion crate that conforms to the WG encoding standard, and in Firefox 56, it replaced a C++ library from 1999. It can convert to and from UTF-8, which makes sense for Rust code, including in Firefox, and it can convert to and from UTF-16, which makes sense for the uh, pre-existing C++ code in Firefox. Uh, in, at Mozilla, we don't use, or we try to avoid using the C++ standard library, but today I'm gonna show you C++ standard library types instead of Mozilla types, uh, because the, the standard library types are probably more relevant to a larger number of you. Um, let's look at uh, the REST API. There's, uh, uh, there are three structs. There's a struct called encoding that represents the idea of an encoding. We have a statically allocated in singleton instance for each one. So there's one for UTF-8, there's one for Windows 1252 and so forth. It provides label resolution. So when in protocol text you have charts that equals foo, foo is a label, and then you can go from that kind of identifier to an instance of, of the struct. And it provides non-streaming conversion, which means conversion in the case where you have all the input available to the converter at one time. When you don't have the input available at one time or you, for some other reason, want to do the conversion incrementally, then encoding acts as a factory for decoder and encoding structs, encoder structs that uh, encapsulate the streaming state. So here we uh, see some code that uses this, how to obtain in instances. First we see that we refer to encoding by references that have the static lifetime because they are statically allocated singletons. If we have a, a, a variable called a byte slice from protocol that contains the foo part from charts that equals foo, we can pass it to uh, encoding for a label, and then we get back an instance, or if it didn't match, then we default to Windows 1252. So we see here uh, as an example that we can indeed refer to the encodings by named static. Then we create use the encoding as a factory to create a decoder, and we see that, as is usual in Rust, the decoder is returned by value. The crate uses uh, enum-based polymorphism. So the names encoding, decoder, and encoder sound like they could be traits, but they are indeed structs, and we'll come back later to why this is important. So for example, uh, the struct decoder has a field variant of type variant decoder, which is an enum that wraps uh, a struct of, that implements a concrete uh, decoder for a given encoding. The fundamental uh, operation of the streaming API looks like this. Uh, it takes a slice of bytes as an input. It takes a caller allocated slice of uh, output code units, so in the streaming operation, there are no heap allocations performed by encoding RS itself. It takes a Boolean indicating whether this is the last slice to convert, and then it returns a tuple of a decoder result, how many bytes were read and how many code units were written. Decoder result is a non-C-like enum because uh, it can wrap in the malformed case 
it can wrap some information about the malformed byte sequence that we saw. In the non-streaming case, uh, we take a slice of bytes as input and, and, and then we tie to its lifetime a cow of stir. So if we are decoding uh, um, an ASCII compatible encoding and the input is all ASCII, then we simply borrow the input and otherwise we have to go and allocate a string. Then we get to the C++ part. So how do we even know what is good modern C++, what, what should we be aiming for? We want some guidelines for using modern C++ well. And there is a document called C++ Core Guidelines that answers this question. And this isn't some random document on the internet, even though it's not um, an, an official document of the C++ Standards Committee. It's edited by Bjarne Straustrup, the creator of C++, and Herb Sutter, the convener of the C++ Standards Committee, so we'll believe that this is authoritative. And when looking at these guidelines, we see that it includes a number of rustic things. Now I'm not saying that C++ gets those things from Rust, rather both languages draw from the same inspirations, but the conclusion remains that if we want to provide a modern C++ API to a Rust crate, we should be trying to recreate the Rust API using C++ types on the other side of the FFI. And, and this way we'll end up with uh, a C++ API that's more modern than the API of a typical C++ library out there. Speaking of C++ libraries, uh, there's a library called Guideline Support Library, uh, which exists because uh, the core guidelines tell you to use a couple of types that are not standardized yet, so GSL provides those. You can find it on GitHub under Microsoft's uh, account. Let's look at the first one of the GSL types, which is GSL not null. It, it, it annotates a C++ pointer type as saying that this pointer is not null, so that's a type system annotation. It also comes with a runtime check to back that up. Uh, it doesn't change the representation of the pointer anyway, so it's a compile time thing in terms of the type. But the check is in runtime. Uh, as an example, um, let's look at how the static singleton instances of the encodings are declared. So in Rust, we first declare a value typed static for each encoding, and then we declare a reference type static that refers to the value type static because this is how you need to do things in Rust. In, in, on the FFI layer, we want to expose C visible pointers to those static value types. So C visible in the sense that their names are not mangled. And since these are pointer types, we need to new type the pointer and implement sync on the new type to keep the Rust compiler happy about the fact that we are exposing global pointers and we're saying that yes, this is now actually okay to do across threads. Then on the C++ side, uh, we have class encoding. We'll see in a moment what it looks like. And then we claim to C++ that these uh, global uh, pointers that come from the, co from the object code that r the Rust compiler gave us, we claim to C++ that their type is GSL not null const pointer to the encoding class. Let's look at the encoding class. We declare it as class encoding final. So it doesn't inherit from anything and we say final so no other class can inherit from it either. Since all the instances came from Rust, they are statically allocated in Rust, we don't want C++ code to be able to accidentally create instances on the C++ side, so we tell C++ that we don't want the default constructor, default copy constructor, default assignment operator, or the default destructor. Then let's look at uh, study unique pointer, which is to C++ as box is to Rust. Now in the Rust API, we didn't see any boxes, so why is this here? The reason is that we saw decoder returned by value, and we saw that decoder, in, in, inside of it, there's this variant decoder, which is a non-C-like enum, so decoder is a non-C-like struct, and we don't have a well-defined way to return it over the FFI by value. 
In theory, we could have C++ allocate some memory, provide a pointer to that memory, have Rust write through the pointer, but then we wouldn't get idiomatic ergonomics on the C++ side, so we take the cost of a heap allocation to get idiomatic ergonomics. Uh, in both cases, these are uh, smart pointers with at most like one owner at a time with move semantics. We can declare both types in both languages. In Rust, when we uh, want a box for foo, we call the constructor for foo, pass it to the con constructor for box. In C++, uh, since C++ 14, it's considered better practice to use a, a function template called uh, make unique uh, to instantiate as to the unique pointer of foo. In both languages, we can tell the smart pointer to forget about the memory that it's managing and give us the raw pointer to the memory. Then in both languages, we can put uh, a smart pointer back together from uh, a raw pointer. Let's look at a concrete example. So on the encoding struct, we had a factory method called new decoder that takes uh, self by reference and returns a decoder by value. Then on the FFI layer, we, uh, since we are wrapping uh, a method of a struct called encoding, we prefix the name of the function with the name of uh, the struct. So we call the function encoding new decoder. Uh, we take uh, what be becomes the self-reference in the case of calling the method as a pointer. So we get a pointer uh, to an encoding as an argument, we return a mute pointer to a decoder. So we call a new decoder on the uh, object that's pointed to by the pointer, pass it to the constructor of box, and then immediately tell box to forget about what it just did. Since we told box to forget about what it just did, we need something else to be able to free this allocation later. So uh, we declare a function called decoder free that takes a pointer to a decoder uh, puts a box back together for it, assigns it to a variable, the variable goes out of scope, and, and, and then uh, the memory gets freed. On the C++ side, uh, we again, like on, in Rust, we had um, uh, a method called new decoder. We declare a method called new decoder that returns a studio unique pointer of decoder, and we say that it's const because it doesn't modify the encoding itself, uh, so the, this pointer is a typed const pointer. We pass the this pointer to the FFI function that we created, and then we construct a unique pointer uh, around the raw pointer that we get back. On the deletion side, it's more involved. Uh, on the decoder object, we have an empty destructor because we don't want that to do anything, and we overload uh, operator delete that takes a void pointer to decoder for reasons, but it's guaranteed to be reinterpretable as a pointer to a decoder, so we do that, and we pass the pointer to the decoder fee, free FFI function, and this way, when studio unique pointer uh, goes out of scope, it, for, it deletes its uh, pointer to decoder, it runs the destructor that does nothing, and then we route the pointer back to Rust for uh, the memory to be freed with the right allocator. And as with encoding, we tell C++ that we don't want instances of, of these to be able to be created on the C++ side. Now, how is that, that possible? We, we had some pointers from Rust, then we just claimed to C++ that these are some pointers uh, to C++ class types, and then we passed the this pointer back to Rust. So what's going on here? To, to see what a method call in, in even means, let's look at method calls in Rust. So if we have a struct foo and it has a, a method getval, and then we have an instance of foo called bar and we call bar.getval. It's just syntactic sugar for foo colon colon getval and passing a reference to bar as an explicit first argument. And, and that sort of explains why it's declared in a way that self is a first argument. So that's all there is to it. And on the C++ side, it's the same story, except uh, this has the role of reference to self in Rust. 
uh, in C++, we don't uh, write the this uh, pointer explicitly in the argument list, but we do write the constness of this uh, after the argument list if we want it to be a const pointer type. The important thing here is that there are no B tables. So uh, in, in Rust, trait ob a, pointer, a tra pointer that to a trait, a trait type pointer is two pointers. One pointer to the object instance and another pointer to an array of function pointers for operating on that instance. And since we want these pointers to travel back and forth between the languages, since C++ um, uses um, um, a plain pointer to point to uh, objects, we can't, we can't uh, have the other pointer from the, the du duplicate dual pointer from Rust travel over because we don't have place for the other half. So that's why we can't have Rust trade objects. On the other hand, C++ needs another place for its uh, B table pointer because the pointers to objects are plain pointers, so it puts its vtable pointer on the objects themselves. So when you have inheritance in C++, C++ goes ahead and dereferences the this pointer to find a vtable pointer. And since this is actually pointing to a Rust object, there is no C++ vtable pointer there, and, and we can't have C++ dereferencing the this pointer so we just can't have any inheritance on the C++ side, which means that we can't inherit from some kind of common superclass of a C++ framework. In Gecko, we don't get to inherit from NSI supports. If, the, if we were in a Qt app, we wouldn't be able to inherit from Q objects, for, for, for example. Then let's take a look at these, uh, more of these uh, rustic C++ types. There's Studio optional, which is like option in Rust. In Rust, we can return none. In C++, we can return student null opt. In Rust, we can return some foo. In C++, we just return foo and some uh, implicit stuff happens. Uh, we can ask if a uh, option or pseudo optional wraps a value. We can get that value, or we can get that value, or if it doesn't wrap a value, take some default. So it looks like it's just the same thing. There is one thing to be aware of though, which is that the most ergonomic way to extract a value from a studio optional is operator star, which is unchecked and therefore unsafe. So watch out for that. In Rust, we often like to return multiple values as tuples. And in C++, we have studio tuple. In both languages, we can uh, declare methods that return a tuple of some types. In both languages, we can take uh, some values and, and return them as a tuple. And in both languages, we can take a return tuple and destructure it into a bunch of variables. As is usual with Rust, if we want mutability in Rust, we say mute, and in, if we don't want mutability in C++, we say const. Again, the same thing. GSL span provides the slice concept for C++. A slice is a pointer and a length, a const pointer in the case of a read-only span. So in C++, GSL span uh, puts these together, and in the case of a read-only span, the const specifier goes inside the type parameter of GSL span. We can use GSL make span to take a span view to a contiguous container, and then we can use a two-argument version of GSL span to put a span together from a pointer and a length. We can access uh, spans like we do slices in, in Rust. We can iterate over them, we can index into them, and indexing is a checked operator, uh, operation even in, in, in C++, so it's safe. And we can take the pointer and length back apart. Again, there's something, some like tiny thing to be aware of, which is that subs taking a subspan is slightly less ergonomic for common cases than in Rust because the subspan span function takes the start index and the length of the subspan, so you have to compute the length yourself in, in, in case you're sort of assuming the Rust thing of being able to pass the index to the uh, next item not included. Since we have our own versions of all of these in, in, in Mozilla code, we get to fix design bugs like that. 
We should be aware that in C++, read-only string slices are a special case called studio string view, or in the UTF-16 case, studio U16 string view, that are already in the standard library, unlike span, which you need to get from GSL. This kind of makes sense, like superficial sense from a Rust perspective, since Rust has separate string slices, but in Rust, those provide UTF-8 validity, these don't, so they aren't that useful compared to GSL span. It's more a matter of the committee being able to agree to these first. But if you use the C++ standard library, you should just be using these and, and not go against uh, the way of the land. A key difference, though, between slices and spans is that spans, a zero-length span can contain a null pointer. A slice can never contain a null pointer because Rust has an optimization that an option of slice ha takes the same space as a slice, and to distinguish uh, some wrapping a zero-length span from none, we need some non-zero bits in the pointer to act as the discriminant. So when you have some pointers that you take from a span and you want to cre create a, a slice with them, you have to uh, have something along the way that replaces all null pointers with uh, bogus pointers. And, and then let's look at a concrete example that puts all these together. O on the encoding struct, we have a static method called for bomb that takes a, byte, uh, a slice of bytes, checks if it starts with a byte order mark, if it doesn't, returns none, if it does, returns uh, uh, a tuple of the encoding and the length of the byte order mark. On the FFI layer, we have a bunch of stuff going on here. Uh, again, we have the same naming convention as before, but since it's a static method, we don't take uh, the, uh, a pointer that would correspond to the self-reference or this uh, pointer. We just take uh, uh, the slice decomposed into pointer and length. Since we have two um, values to return the encoding and the length of the bomb. We, we, don't, we only get one return value from C, so we use that for uh, a pointer to encoding, and then we need an out param uh, for the length of the bomb. Since the length of the bomb is kind of logically related to the incoming slice, instead of introducing an, an extra out param, we uh, reuse the incoming length as an in out param, so it's a uh, a mute pointer to use size instead of use size. In the case the Rust uh, method returns none, we return uh, a null pointer and zero length, and then on the C++ side we reverse the whole thing. And now we get to declare, recreate the Rust API on C++ side. So on, on class encoding we have a static method called for bomb that returns a studio optional containing a studio tuple containing GSL not null of const pointer to encoding and a size t and as an argument takes a GSL span of const u int 8t. And, and then we need to create a, a stack variable for use its address as an in-out param. Uh, we when we take the pointer from the slice, we pass it to null to bogus in order to make it okay to use as a pointer to a slice. If we get back a non-null encoding, we create uh, a studio tuple, um, and, and here we need to do it explicitly because we have a tuple inside an option, so the brace syntax uh, would make uh, the inference fall over. We have to tell it first that this is a tuple, and then the optional gets created implicitly, and, and if we got uh, a null pointer, we return a studio null opt. In, in the streaming API, though, we saw that we had a non-C-like enum in, in the Rust API. So can we do the same thing with it? C++ does have uh, a type-safe uh, discriminated union type called studio variant, but unfortunately, it's not really enum. The variants are not named. It was proposed as L variant, but not accepted. It's legal to declare duplicate types, but if you do, things become really impractical, so not in practice. Uh, but most importantly, there's no language level uh, analog for match, 
One was proposed as inspect, but again, not accepted. So instead, I just ended up manually packing the bits into a U32 and using that both in the C API and in the C++ API. Since most of the time, uh, the, in, the information wrapped in the malformed case isn't gonna be looked at by most applications. It's just specialized applications that actually want to look at that. What about the cows, though? Uh, in the non-streaming API, we saw that encoding RS was returning cows of spur. And even the cow part isn't the problem, just the, 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 the string uh, or vec is a problem because C doesn't have like universally accepted uh, like standard library way of representing a growable buffer that knows its length. But since the non-streaming API is just convenience functionality on top of the streaming API, I just didn't uh, expose uh, the non-streaming API to C at all and instead recreated that functionality on top of the stream, streaming functionality on the C++ side. So in C++, we could, in principle, uh, declare a studio variant of studio string and studio string view, and that would be like structurally the same thing as a cow. But in C++, we don't have a, a borrow checker, so we can't represent the lifetime of studio string view, which makes this sort of thing very unsafe in C++. So if, if we uh, return a, string, uh, a studio string view or a GSL span, there is no compiler mechanism making sure that the memory that it points to lives for as long, at least as long enough as, uh, as long as the uh, string view or span. So instead, I decided to keep it simple for the uh, standard library binding and just return a studio string in this case. In the Gecko case, uh, XPCOM strings have or can have heap allocated uh, shared buffers, so in that case, uh, a borrow just becomes a reference count increment, so borrow was possible uh, in a safe way in the Gecko case. In fairness, let's look at what we didn't see today. So it seemed like, okay, we had these things, and they nicely translated to C++, except for the enum instead of variant thing, and like, this looked nice, so, so w in fairness, what was not here in this example? We didn't see Rust code examining any non-primitive C++ types. It's totally doable, but we didn't see it today. We didn't see Rust code holding pointers to C++ objects. Again, doable, but increases complexity. And we didn't see Rust code calling out to FFI. And, and again, it's doable, but if you do, watch out for C++, the C++ code that you call into freeing the arguments that you got from C++. It's a, like a normal C++ concern, but when you're writing Rust code, you might not be thinking of it in terms of your arguments disappearing while you are in, in a function. So let's recap what we saw. We, we saw that the this pointer in C++ is just like a reference to self, and, and those are just syntactic sugar in the non-inherited, non-trait case. So we can't have a C++ inheritance. We can't have Rust trait objects going over the boundary. However, we can declare C++ visible Rust statics. Uh, we saw how GSL not null can be used to make C++ pointers more like Rust references. We learned about studio unique pointer, which is to C++ as box is to Rust. We saw how to tell C++ that we don't want some default constructors generated so that we don't accidentally instantiate the reflector classes from C++. Uh, we saw how we can use overloading of operator delete to route the deletion of a heap allocated Rust object that pretends to be a C++ object back to Rust when it's time to uh, uh, release it. We saw that C++ now has a studio optional that is just like option in R Rust that we use a lot. We saw that we can return multiple values in both languages. Uh, we saw that uh, there is a, the slice concept uh, in C++ 
and there's a special case for read-only string slices. And we saw that, there, that discriminated type safe unions exist, but they are kind of inconvenient to use. And then uh, we saw, saw that the C++ type system is able to represent the structure of cows, but not their lifetimes, which makes cows dangerous in C++. So we shouldn't just do all the things we do in Rust in C++, but like this thing becomes dangerous, so let's not do that one. And that's it. You can find the slides at that address. Thanks. <laughs>